Today I want to talk to you about the concepts and the abstractions of programmability. This series always aims to introduce a higher level of abstraction for the concepts that we are analyzing, to see them in a broader view. Programming, of course, narrowly viewed is the ability to give instructions to a computer and to make the computer do what we want. For the past decades, as computers uh, became more and more pervasive uh, in society, they morphed into many different things. Not only the electronic brains of the 50s or the personal computers of the 80s and 90s, not only the mobile phones uh, that uh, each of us are now carrying in our pockets, but really in every area of society, computers are helping us in various ways, in different forms, managing complexity, measuring and acquiring data, supporting our decisions. So programming today is much more than not just the narrow definition uh, of a few decades ago. And programmability is the opposite. What are the things that we didn't believe could be handled by computers? What are the things that we didn't realize could be made smart through the help of people who learned how to program and who learned how to dynamically exploit various features of the infrastructure that was available to them, achieving results that are far superior than not what was possible to obtain in a more static view of those same systems. Now, even though at the beginning I did say that we want to bring these considerations at a higher level of abstraction, maybe this sounds a little bit too abstract. So let me make it very concrete with a few examples. The first one that I would like to offer is the concept of programmable money. You may have heard this uh, expression in relation, for example, to Bitcoin or to Ethereum. In general, the concept of blockchains and cryptocurrencies. Think about it. When we had metal coins or banknotes as money, their features were embedded in their physical properties and they were very static. They could evolve in time, but this evolution was over the course of decades or centuries. And to introduce new features in a monetary system required very often wars and revolutions. It wasn't possible to update how money would work without that. For example, uh, when coins were made out of precious metal, people would start shaving off a little bit of that precious metal from each coin, imperceptibly stealing a little bit of gold or silver, and then collect the powder that could be, uh, of course, sold again. And somebody receiving the coin that was debased through this uh, shaving um, and uh, theft would not necessarily be able to tell the difference. The ridges that you see on the coins today, even though the coins today are not made of precious metals, are the remnant of an upgrading of the monetary system where the ridges stopped the thieves from shaving off the precious metal because somebody receiving the debased coin 
would be able to tell that the ridges were missing and as a consequence they shouldn't accept the coin because the value of the coin was directly represented by the precious metal. As a side note, of course, debasing was done directly by uh, the mints because famously even by the Roman Empire, what was happening is that less and less precious metal was included in the coins as a percentage of the total metal content and the Roman Empire were still pretending that the value of their money should stay the same. And this was accepted for a little bit of time, but then everybody uh, came to the understanding that this was not acceptable anymore. And that put a very um, chaotic pressure and transformation on the Roman economy that according to uh, some who look at the economic roots of uh, social change uh, was uh, one of the reasons, one of the main reasons for the downfall uh, of the Roman Empire. Or think about the invention of banknotes themselves. The fact that uh, we could um, pass uh, an IOU uh, from somebody um, to somebody else. And this chain of debt was universally accepted and the banknotes could be used in various ways as a store of value, unless you had a fire, as a medium of exchange, as a unit of account in the various forms that we uh, understand money. And of course, a few decades ago, uh, another transformation of money started when it started to become digital, where there wasn't any precious metal, there wasn't any banknote, uh, just in bank ledgers the numbers representing the balance of an account and the changes in this balance towards another ledger was how money was started, uh, starting to be handled. And we very uh, happily went towards that direction because rather than shipping uh, uh, large amounts of, uh, of, of cash, transferring value with electronic orders was much more convenient. Today, letting aside how exactly this happens in terms of decentralized trust, security, what we can do with blockchains and Bitcoin and Ethereum and many, many other modern types of digital money is to actually explicitly design and implement new features in them. If you want to implement different types of lending, um, derivatives of particular kind, of kinds that have never been possible before, you can either do it yourself or you can hire uh, an Ethereum developer to do it for you, and the so-called smart contracts will embody and implement over the blockchain this new function of money. And then it will be just a question of promoting that new function and letting other people see that it is actually useful, have them adopt it, and whether slowly or very rapidly, uh, millions or billions of people starting to realize that they can now do things that they didn't think could be done with money before. And very importantly, none of these steps in upgrading money require the central planning or the revolutions or the wars that were necessary before where uh, we needed a lot of time and they can, as a consequence, be experimented with in a very agile manner where we can understand what works, we can discard what doesn't work and in general improve 
the features of modern money much faster. Let me give you another example of programmability. Solar energy. Our energy infrastructure fundamentally enables and empowers our society. If you only have uh, firewood and you are jealously conserving uh, the previous fire because you have a hard time even starting it, and then uh, when you settle after uh, a day's uh, worth of uh, foraging and, uh, and, and migrating in your uh, nomadic tribe and uh, those who are entrusted with preserving the embers of the previous night's fire start a new one. The things that you can do uh, with the energy, the chemical energy of that wood fire are very few. You can cook uh, the meat that you hunted during the day. Uh, you can huddle around the fire to uh, receive its warmth and uh, you can preserve it uh, for next day's uh, tasks and objectives, but not much more. In today's traditional energy infrastructure, we can do many more things. We help in transportation. We help in growing food with the creation of artificial fertilizers that enhance the ability of the soil to support plant growth. We are using it to eliminate the difference between night and day, extending greatly both the geographical range as well as the hours during the day uh, during which we can be productive. And many, many other things. Fundamentally, too, energy powers our communication methodologies, our tools to both analyze, formalize, store, and transmit knowledge that we accumulate at an accelerating pace. But once again, to add new features to our energy infrastructure is cumbersome. It took us hundreds of years um, to deploy the uh, power of previous inventions in, in energy. It took us uh, an entire century to fully exploit uh, what uh, uh, petroleum represented uh, in our ability to, to generate energy, uh, both directly as chemical energy in our cars or to generate electricity uh, in our power plants. But now we are starting to realize that with solar energy and batteries, we are entering a phase of programmable energy systems. Many things that once were viewed as weaknesses of these new systems are now becoming strengths. We discover how resilient the coupling of uh, solar energy, but also wind and hydro renewables in general, together with battery uh, storage systems is how rapidly they can respond to uh, varied needs coming online uh, in a matter of um, microseconds uh, in order to supplement uh, the needs of an electric grid uh, that is on the verge of failing and avoiding blackouts and brownouts that uh, can uh, be disasters. But also, for example, providing uh, light to uh, totally isolated villages that previously could only obtain light, artificial light uh, during the night using uh, expensive, um, dirty, 
uh, and harmful to the health uh, uh, diesel generators. So the next steps are going to be to make sure that we fully understand how to introduce new features. We are, for example, rapidly developing um, fully electric cars that uh, are representing not only a novel means of transportation, but they are also the basis of a distributed storage mechanism. When an electric car is parked and its battery is full, a new energy market could bid for the electricity contained in that battery and buy that uh, energy uh, at a price that is much higher than the price that uh, it cost to originally acquire it. That is just one example of a completely new feature of this programmable energy infrastructure that we are designing. The last example that I want to give, and there can be many more if you are interested in learning about further examples of general infrastructure programmability, absolutely please reach out and let me know uh, either in the comments to this video or via email or on social media and I will be very happy to provide further examples or actually I invite you uh, to uh, design based on what you heard other examples in other sectors of society. So the last example that I want to give is that regarding smart cities. Smart cities are obviously a great idea and we are aiming to make our cities smart in order to be able to support uh, the inhabitants in a manner that uh, fulfills their objectives and really strongly uh, furthers their uh, ability to, to grow together with the, with the city, adapting to the environment, but also being able to accommodate inventions that are going to come in the next decades, very flexibly, uh, very openly. Smart cities are the ultimate example of uh, programmability exactly because what is assumed that each of the component infrastructures of buildings, of transportation, of energy, but also water, sewage, and other uh, forms of support that the city provides to its inhabitants are accessible uh, by various types of computers and are programmable in the sense that we can garner data, we can analyze that data, and we can make decisions that are fed back in the loop uh, to make sure that uh, enough uh, water is stored and enough water is distributed, uh, enough water is collected as the runoff uh, of uh, the various uh, systems. Um, now, of course, with programmability, there come enormous new responsibilities. We didn't have to worry about uh, malicious attacks um, against our um, energy infrastructure when we had uh, just a, a bonfire uh, in the middle of our campground uh, in prehistoric times or rather defending against uh, that malicious attack, internal or external, was relatively simple. Today we have to worry about cyber attacks and various unexpected surfaces of vulnerability in all of these infrastructures. So we have to develop the programmability of each of these and any forthcoming new programmable infrastructure with deep security in mind. That is why, since its security 
is constantly probed and constantly uh, attacked because of the economic gain that one can have uh, if one of these attacks is successful, blockchains are so promising. They are open source, so it can uh, be argued that uh, any vulnerability that is found is very quickly discovered because thousands of people are seeking to find vulnerabilities and the code is available for anybody to, to look at rather than just to a few. They are uh, distributed all over the world and uh, anybody can tinker with them, anybody can add uh, new features that can spread rapidly uh, if they prove to be useful. And based on various consensus mechanisms, they can provide um, very novel uh, trust mechanisms to introduce the features into the main lines of uh, implementation and use. Um, so I do believe that blockchains are going to uh, play uh, an important role in providing secure programmability in the new programmable infrastructures that we are going to um, take advantage of in the future. So what is the ultimate programmability? Well, certainly biohacking represents an incredible frontier. We are on the verge of understanding enough about our metabolism, the way our genetics uh, works based on DNA and its various expressions. We are starting to understand enough about the way that our nervous system works and our brain works. So we are going to absolutely, guaranteedly tinker with these systems and make them programmable. What is your nature in the future? What are the features and characteristics that you will have in terms of sensory inputs, in terms of ability to communicate, or uh, what environment you are adapted best to is going to open incredible new degrees of freedom. And we will leverage those degrees of freedom, hopefully responsibly, but certainly unstoppably. So I believe that programmability is certainly a novel feature that is blossoming today around all that comprises human society. And we are going to recognize and debate how best to use these new features. Developers have a specific expression, APIs, Application Programmer Interfaces. And it is an acronym that is worth Keeping in mind, any time that you find a new gadget or you move into a new home or you sign up for a new service, ask the creator of the gadget, the previous owner of the home or uh, the provider of the platform that supports the service. Do you have an API? Can I use that API? What are the active security measures that you are putting in place so that the API cannot be maliciously exploited against my interests. And if the answers are lacking, you know that we still have a long way to go, but more and more often the answer would be positive and it will give surprising new opportunities to fully enjoy the advantages that each of these systems can provide you. So thank you for watching this latest episode of The Context. I greatly enjoy recording them on a weekly basis and my ability as well as my teams to continue to do so 
entirely depends on your attention, on your enthusiasm, and on your support. You can become a supporter of The Context on Patreon. For as little as $5 a month, uh, you will help me and my team to continue analyzing and creating the future together.